Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We are here for four days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. It's our 12th year of theCUBE. We've seen the journey. It's like a documentary that's playing out right in front of us. We're documenting the whole thing. The Cube's the generative process for all the videos. Um, I'm John Furrier with my good friend, Jerry Chen, who was here with theCUBE on the inaugural broadcast uh, 12 years ago. Just left VMware, just newly minted venture capitalist at Greylock at that time. Uh, has been part of our journey, good friend of theCUBE. Jerry, great to see you uh, and John, here on the 12th Cube. Yeah. We should do a montage, see how we, we age over the 12 years, you know, for, <laughs> yeah. from like how, how it started, how it's going. <laughs> yeah, definitely got gray for sure. People are like, hey, you have gray hair now. But you know, it's fun. Yeah, you know, I was telling the story earlier because this is a reinvent where they're doing a yeah. lot of throwback. Oh yeah, back in the original day of yeah. Amazon. Have you noticed there's a lot of throwback stories? Yeah, yeah. Remember the way it used to be? Um, um, I was telling the story about how when the Cube started, we had the stream on the whole time. Correct. We had no guest list. Hey, there's James Hamilton. Come on up. He's like, what? And he sits down and I exposed the entire back end, and he was never on the cube again. <laughs> they had a PR department at that point. Um, you were there. You came on, um, and it was great. You we had, we asked we had a great question. That's actually on YouTube right now. The one people want to check it out. But I think that the stuff that we talked about was very relevant today. And sure. Your thesis when you started coming out of VMware at Greylock was you, you made one comment. I'll, I want to get your reaction to. I'm looking for the next Amazon when I ask what's your investor, because sure. uh, you were in a curious way like I'm looking for the next big thing. Yeah. Um, Amazon still is that next big thing, but we were talking about how cloud scale, you were on the uh, early days of seeing that 20 mile stare of what Amazon could turn into. Yeah. And, you know, and you've been on many other times. Looking back now, first of all, reaction to that, and then looking back now, what's been the key moments for you for AWS in this industry as cloud went mainstream? I mean, I would say the past 12, 13 years have been living this cloud mobile transition. Right, you know, the, the two platforms that came out in like 2008, 2007, the iPhone came out and the AWS launched in like 08 or something like that, I guess 13 years ago. And so what we got right was we were on the right side of history that this move towards cloud mobile and just rewriting your applications. You say phase one was just move the stuff you had in your data center to the cloud, right? Phase two is okay, let's rewrite things for in a cloud native way. And Amazon's really pioneered what cloud native means. Now we're seeing what AI native means, right? And so I think you've seen all the announcements this week and clearly we talked to a bunch of startups and yeah. a bunch of developers and a bunch of customers. It's what is AI native enterprise, what's AI native companies, like, you know, we used to talk about is AI or die for both customers and for startups. And so I think we're seeing Amazon try to reinvent themselves to say we're the AI native cloud. And make it easier for developers, kind of the core thing Matt Garman put on his first slide was developers. Yeah. I love developers. And he said, they're near and dear to my heart. And they said, I got a billion dollars of credits. And I'm like, I got to make an email to Garamond and get those credits. But um, that's a that's a game statement right there. They're saying- Take, take a page out of Microsoft's book, right? Yeah. Developers. Yeah, developers. <laughs> so, okay, so now if, if you're a developer, and I was telling the story last night at a dinner, uh, I was a reporter who was first time at uh, reInvent. I go, you got to remember in 2008 when the financial crisis hit, Yeah, um, it was kind of Armageddon. You had the, the web 2.0 post bubble, and then you saw YouTube come out, they got bought by Google, and that whole web 2.0 face. So, but a lot of companies were kind of hanging around. People were unemployed, they couldn't get gigs, and so people were trying to figure out how to sell cereal in their apartment, okay? Two couple developers, that became Airbnb. Yeah. Okay, so you had Dropbox, so all this kind of web um, SaaS players, because it was serendipitous, it, and they were kind of like, experimenting. And so there's a lot of experimentation in the narrative now, experiment. And so that brings up the serendipity. So this is the entrepreneurial question for you, Jerry, is that we're in a market where it's like kind of transitioning, big wave, old wave, transition to a new wave, AI native. There's a lot of serendipity in meeting people, experimenting with stuff, and then just huge upside. So the question is, these entrepreneurs that are under 30, say 30, you know, 25 years old, right out of college, what are they building on? And so what do you see? Because when they yeah. were 15, they were using Google Docs. Sure. They weren't like, cloud was my dad's cloud. <laughs> <laughs> so not, not your dad's Amazon. automobile? He's, oh, it's my, not your dad's cloud. My, my dad used the console. I have a console. It doesn't have autocorrect. I can't yeah. make comments. Yeah. Like, so code writing. So I bring that up. It's a little bit over the top. But my, to make the point, generationally, sure. what do you see um, in the next generation? I mean, I think the way you're going to teach CS and code changes with, with AI, right? Both the tools from 
GitHub Copilot to all these AI engineering tools like Cursor, um, Cognition, et cetera. They're all great. We're in a couple called StackBlitz launched this thing called Vault.new, amazing product, right? Vercel, V0. So Vault.new is an incredible way to like prototype apps quickly. And I think what you're seeing is two things. One, the tools you have to make yourself a better fast developer are there. So you have, everyone has some new superpowers. Again, making it, we thought cloud gave you superpowers developer, tools like Copilot or, you know, Cursor or Bolt gives you superpowers. Number two, uh, how you think about apps change, right? So you have this thing called the LLM, the large language models, video models, right? You know, you have kind of this- Ephemeral apps. Ephemeral apps. So you have, you have this, before you had the internet, which is an incredible resource. What that gave you, they gave you billions of users, access to information, ease of communication. Now you have all that, plus this kind of brain called these large language models that do reasoning to help you even more. So nothing ever gets replaced, right? We just kind of build yeah. these layers. Again, the cloud layer from infrastructure, networking, storage. Now we have everything we built beforehand, these new AI tools to make you faster, and then you have storage, elasticity, right? What Amazon pioneered, the internet, right? Mobile phones. But now you have reasoning models, access to like large language models to understand you know, communication, languages. So that puts you in a whole different creative space. It's just when mobile came out, they built like said Airbnb, Uber, right? You had maps and GPS and the power of your, your, your hand. Now you have all that plus these large yeah. models. So I, I say, um, what does AI need to mean for these like 25 year old founders and developers or large enterprises is take everything you have, but imagine you have this super powerful AI resource to plug into and that just creates a new creative space. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, uh, great, great insight. The other question I want to ask you is that if you look at like, because we used to joke about you, Pete Sunsini, and, and Steve Harrod as the VMware Mafia. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And PayPal has a mafia. And it's, it's, it's a term to denote people who have worked at big, great companies, have gone on to do other things, usually build companies or be an investor. If you look at the, some of the startups I've been interviewing um, that are under the age of 30 or around that age group, they all came from these big companies like Facebook Meta. Yeah. Google, Amazon, Twitter, Uber. Uber. Yeah. So the people who have built by hand yeah. large scale systems. Yeah. Okay. So you're seeing it, and you know what they're working on? Enterprise solutions. Yeah. So you have a, another wave of personas working on like hard enterprise stuff. Like it used to be when we were growing up, it was like, oh yeah, consumer. Enterprise lags, not. Enterprise not lagging. And, and enterprise has always been fun in my book, you well, know. No, but no, man. I'm saying, but from a trend standpoint, <laughs> sure. Yeah, of course, we love the enterprise. We we dig into it every day. But the, they're actually starting companies with the enterprise in mind because they walk into someone like a J.P. Morgan Chase or a Gold yeah. and say, "Oh, you know, you got identity problems? Well, we built a system over at Uber to do that." Like, yeah. and so they're seeing problems. I've never seen that before. I've never seen like the pure entrepreneurial, but it comes from their DNA. That comes from like it's the pedigree of the entrepreneurs, it's that where they've come from. Yeah. What's your well, view on that? Do you well, see the same thing or? For sure, I would really say, especially from systems and infrastructure, folks on like Uber, before that Meta, they've seen the future, right? Like, or go, they, they've seen problems at scale. They also seen this problem before, like when they have access to infinite resources, compute storage, networking, and you test billions of users, they can, see where the rest of the world is. So like the old line, the future's here, it's not evenly distributed. Yeah. So we like to say those folks come out of Uber or whatever, saw the future, and they come out of these, they create companies like Corona Severe Temporal from yep. Uber's data team, for example. And I think you're seeing these folks come out and say, hey, I can solve these enterprise problems, the security, scale, observability, now with the things, lessons I learned inside these big companies. And then, you know, AI, like I said, is, is additional resource and it makes, um, it makes a lot of these apps more approachable, right? You know, this whole thing, we talk about the system engagement of chat. So chat, like Slack and messaging has always been around, but was never easy to scale because you had to have a human on other side. Mm -hmm. But now with these large language models, chat is easy and working. Voice is working for the first time ever, right? Before it was kind of working. And so I would say the usability of making enterprise apps because you have these large language models has changed. So the system engagement is still chat. System of action, these agents now mm -hmm. are actually working. And so it's kind of cool because before a lot of young developers were like, I don't want to touch enterprise. You know, have you seen, you know, ServiceNow or Oracle's like UI or, or uh, you know, concurs? They don't want to touch that. But like, holy crap, I can now make all that stuff sexy again because A, design aesthetic, B, 
be mobile and C, you know, I can use things like chat or voice to make these things yeah. approachable, right? I can make software human-like with, with AI. Yeah, and so make it better. So let's talk about the uh, inv your investment thesis. What are you seeing on the investment side? Obviously, rounds are um, with AI is pretty hyped up right now. What's the market like <laughs> from a VC perspective as you look at trying to get the early stage action? Yeah, I mean, look, we're yeah. always trying to be the first money in, like seed series A. We want to back the founders right when they leave the companies or come out of school and they have this kind of crazy idea. Um, like all things, the valuations, every VC is going to play about, complain about valuations all the time, right? <laughs> Um, so I won't, won't touch that with a 10-foot pole because it's never going to be the right price until it is, right? <laughs> until it's a $100 billion company, then any price is the right price. Um, but I think what you see is just the enthusiasm of this new platform shift, right? I think, like I so said, when 04, 05 was kind of a web 2.0, then 08, 09, 010, kind of cloud mobile. And we saw a whole bunch of folks mm -hmm. invest in native mobile experience like Instagram, native mobile photo sharing, or native mobile databases in the cloud. Now you're seeing these AI native applications. And so I think you're seeing that kind of enthusiasm we did around that platform shift around cloud mobile now yeah. apply to AI. It's not really a platform shift yet because the way you consume software is still the same. I'm like we're playing around with wearables and you know glasses and goggles, but the way you consume software is still the same. But you see that same enthusiasm of like, hey, I can rewrite everything for the iPhone, I can rewrite write everything for the cloud, I can rewrite everything for using AI now. And it's um, it's pretty interesting. It's, 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 it's early, but it'll be a race. So I'll get your reaction to that. First of all, good good, good, good insight there. So there's, I see three areas of AI. AI producers, I, pre I make AI. Okay. AI consumers, I consume okay. the AI. And data suppliers. I'm gonna stop. Because data is, yeah. I mean, everyone's, I know. it's a tight resource. Well, it's the oil, is the resource, All the whatever. foundation models use the same data. I mean, they're all kind of pedaling as fast as they can, but differentiation will come from data. So do you agree with that? Is there an area I'm missing in terms of categories of who you are? I mean, obviously, you look at the players. Like, are you either a provider, okay. a consumer? A provider is what in your mind? Uh, someone who's building AI technology okay. to people, and I like I would be a consumer. I use OpenAI or whatever. Um, I use some rag. That's a that's an application. I'm consuming. Yeah. That's not really AI, but in terms of my mind. But um, data suppliers. Hey, I got unique data that could add to your corpus. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like open AI would be a provider. I think yeah. I think you definitely have to, everyone's going to be a consumer, yeah. right? It'll either be visible or invisible. But everyone's going to be a consumer, just like everyone's a consumer of the internet in some form or fashion. Yeah. So I think it's going to be there, but it's going to be ubiquitous. Providers are, are going to change. You have these pure play folks like OpenAI. You have everything in this, this stack of AI tools. Um, that's still settling out. We don't know. Like we're a couple of Llama Index building agents. Picks and shovels. Picks and shovels. They're yeah. letting you build like, you know, agentic systems, knowledge systems for your consumers. And then for sure, data is ubiquitous, right? I, again, it's both for pre-training, mm -hmm. it's for post-training, it's for um, evaluations. What I mean by that is when you have your AI doctor, you're going to have someone both get the, the training for the for the model, but also make sure the doctors say the model is working yes or nay, yeah or nay, right? Evals, right? Evaluating the, the output of the models. And so I would say we're, you know, it's beyond our PhD knowledge for you and I, since we have zero PhDs between the two of us. <laughs> but you know, there's argument that we're writing out data for the pre-training, things are moving to post-training, and then things are moved to kind of this like evaluations of like high value evals. But what that means is like lawyers, doctors, accountants, right? So we do um, compliance, Sarbones, Oxley, right? Um, legal. You want to have specialists saying the models working, not mod are working, or the apps working, not working. So I think you're going to see a lot of the data emphasis, John, move to that domain, right? Is the model doing what it's supposed to for healthcare, for legal, for you know technology, for encoding is the first, right? It's a lot like of process management, getting the workflows, automate those. There's expertise. So there's yeah. a bunch of horizontal stuff that we'll figure out. Coding is one we talked about. That's people, are, does the code work or not, right? So if it's binary like that, yes, the code ran or didn't ran, run, that's easy. When it's a little fuzzier, you know, like, oh, is this AI-generated image good or bad? Is the AI-generated song good or bad, right? Who knows, right? And that, that's a whole new set of consumer AI experiences that we're excited about. Like, is this AI experience interesting or not? Who's to tell? And then on these enterprise use cases like legal, healthcare compliance, are you doing what you expect, right? You know, and who's going to know if an AI lawyer is good except a real lawyer? And so you're going to see a lot of, I think, emphasis on the data move towards the outputs of AI, not just the inputs. So 12 years ago, I asked you, uh, um, what are you investing in? You said the next 
AWS. Next, next Amazon, yes. Um, well, it's here. It's called <laughs> Amazon Web Services. Um, what's your view of where they're at compared to the, some of the cloud competitors? Google's got a nice cloud they're building. They're got some good AI going yeah. on um, as well. And the Amazon's playing the long game. Get Microsoft yeah. doing their thing. What's your view of the current cloud market? I think we talked about this a couple of keeps ago. You know, Woodson Barksdale once said there's only two ways to make money in tech, bundling and unbundling, right? And you can argue that Amazon was the great bundling of everything into the cloud. Compute, storage, networking, now AI stuff into the cloud. You can argue then, you know, for a while we saw this unbundling, right? And people apply the consumer, like the, the unbundling and Craigslist. It's every category Craigslist is a startup. But you can say for a while we're unbundling all the cloud guys to databases, Snowflake, Databricks, observability, Chronosphere, Datadog, um, you know, applications. And so you can say we're unbundling all the pieces of Amazon for a bit. And that was an investment thesis that we were looking at Greylock, right? Investing the different little um, categories of Amazon unbundling. And so the question to your point is with AI, is that going to be unbundling? So is OpenAI, Anthropic, these other models, a component of a bundle, right? An AI cloud or a separate business in itself, you know? Are these AI apps, are they going to be part of a bundle or unbundled and, and consumers want to buy and everything piecemeal? And so- That's a good question. That's a great question. And I think you see, you know, Amazon, Azure, Google, bundling a bunch of services together, right? And they say the AI stuff should be tied to your storage, to your networking. Lots of great reasons for that as well. But then you're seeing GPU clouds, right? Like Crusoe, um, Lambda, guys like Together or Fireworks or a company we're involved in called Base10 that does, you know, inference for your models, right? And they work on all the clouds, like Base10's on Google, Amazon, you know, I think Oracle, a bunch of guys. Um, so I think you might see some unbundling the services because of AI, because it's, it's very different than what you had before. Yeah. These guys don't go away, but I, I think there's a great opportunity to build the next Amazon. Yeah. Maybe outside Amazon, maybe on Amazon, like, you know, Amazon. Specialty clouds could be a nice thing. It's either but two things. One, what we call BYOC, bring your own cloud. You know, we're a company called Warpstream that Confluent acquired that did BYOC or, or private cloud, right? It's just, you know, Amazon's so darn big now, really on premise, we're going to be in your, your, your VPC, like your cloud, your, your keys, your S3 bucket. Yep. That's pretty damn interesting. But then to your point, there might be some specialty clouds out there just because the gravity has moved um, towards this whole new stack. And look, again, nothing ever goes away, but we're bullish that uh, there's a bunch of new companies started yeah. in this unbundling phase. And you know, yeah. look at Snowflake and Databricks, two great companies that are unbundling parts of the data. They have a real chance to create uh, a mm -hmm. gravity well around them. Yeah, great, great insight. Final question before we break. What, what's the hallway conversations like? Um, you know, we're out both seeing each other at the different events. Yeah. A um, lot of hallway action, sidebars. Yeah. What's the scuttlebutt? What are you hearing? What's, what's your ear on the ground tell you? Uh, I think people feel like this re-event is probably, I don't know if the intense as large as maybe the peak levels, right? So, if, you know, post-COVID, we were here, the attendance dropped, it's been building back up. But we think both Matt Garman joining with new CEO and with AI and a lot of the moves that are moving, plus this crowd, people feel like, Holy cow! It feels, you know, like yeah. it's it's the peak show again, right? And before it was a couple of years where who knows what was going on, it was coming back, but um, for many years it still is at the center of, of of cloud tech and potentially AI tech. Now I think people feel that way again. Yeah, I would agree with that. I also add that I've heard a lot of first timers coming. Yeah, first time at reInvent, like oh, really welcome to the jungle, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, wrapping up our day. Appreciate you. Thanks. I appreciate you, John. All right. It's always a pleasure to be here. And hey, congratulations to you, the Cube, the whole business you put together. Yeah. It's pretty freaking amazing, yeah. man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry Chen, part of our journey from day one, 12 years ago here at reInvent, 15 years with the Cube. And again, we're continuing, we're just doing our part, just documenting history, sharing the data with you. Soon we'll have a generative agent technology to cut it all up for you. Next Thanks. year, your agent and my agent will do, we'll do an interview with our, our virtual agent. I'll have my agent call your agent, my sub-agent, multi-agent collaboration, big part of the story. Thanks for watching, see you next time.